And good morning, Tom Moran here from Tom's Big Spiders. I'm just going to warn everybody ahead of time that uh, this one might sound a little different than some of the other ones, and there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, I picked up a new microphone. I've been meaning to for quite some time, and I'll explain that whole backstory in a moment. But one of the things I'm now realizing is that I got very accustomed to my old microphone, which was incredibly cheap, which is probably why the sound quality wasn't particularly great. However, it worked great for filtering out some of the background noises because it wasn't particularly powerful. It didn't catch some of the things that were going on around me. So many times I've referenced the fact that my dogs are licking in the background or clicking around in the kitchen and people be like, I, I couldn't hear anything. And that's because the microphone wasn't particularly strong enough to catch it. And I've been playing with the gains on this now for a couple days, trying to get it to a point where it sounds good enough, but it's not picking up every single little noise that's going on around me. So I apologize in advance. Uh, it's going to take a little extra work in post-production, which before I, I kind of had it down to a science, what I needed to do to kind of make it sound decent. And now I'm going to have to ed edit a little bit more noise out. So anyway, it's a learning curve for me. So I apologize because people have listened before. It's probably going to sound differently. Also in my earphones right now, it's only coming out mono. So I'm praying that this is actually going to come out stereo when it's done. Uh, a little, little, little scary. But anyway, the, the reason why we have the new microphone is recently, and I alluded to this, I believe last podcast, my computer uh, broke down and we had to get it fixed. And basically I went on Facebook and long story short, put a thing on Facebook, just let people know that I could be out of commission for a while. It did, it did impact my videos because I haven't gotten a video out in two weeks now. I'm hoping to get one finished this weekend, but I was really afraid that sometimes I disappear with the videos. And I think people know this now that if I get busy, there won't be a video for a little while and that's fine but the podcast we've had that going now for several consecutive weeks and I didn't want to miss the podcast and have people wonder where the heck I was so I basically put on Facebook hey just let everybody know my computer is not working if it's a quick fix I'll you know be back but I was worried that it might be the computer just dying in which case I would have to buy a new computer it would take a little while well, unbeknownst to me, some incredibly generous hobbyists put together apparently a GoFundMe page, which I found out after the fact, and basically collected some money to help me get a new computer or, I guess, a general appreciation of what I do, which I, I have to say is incredibly humbling. Uh, we found out about it basically because I had a package delivered, and I'm always getting stuff in the mail, a lot of Amazon stuff or whatever, and Billy's like, you got a package here, and I'm like, I don't recall having anything ordered, so we opened it up, and I guess Billy had gotten a return for something they had overcharged her with on shipping, and she's like, oh, this this is probably what I got. I got like $15 because they overcharged me on shipping. They gave it to me on a little card, so I open it up, and it's, it's a card and a little gift box. I'm like, oh, maybe that's the same thing for me. Let's see how much it is, and then I noticed it was for a ridiculously high amount of money, and then I worried, and I was like, this is not just for shipping. There's no way they overcharged me you know, this amount of money for shipping. So there was, we went into panic mode a little bit only because I had no idea what was going on and I didn't want Amazon to think I was trying to, you know, steal something from them that I didn't deserve. Come to find out, we found out about the GoFundMe page. And again, my first reaction was I was embarrassed because I, I think people have realized now that I, I have a hard time taking money for something I'm doing for fun. It's, you know been an obstacle for me for day one. This was never supposed to be anything. It was never supposed to be a business. I've done a lot of things in my life. Like I used to do illustration work. Billy and I did a small press publishing company for a little while, putting out like, you know, high end books and stuff. And that was, if I'm not honest, I was a terrible businessman because I did it more for fun, but that was a business. That was something that we needed to make enough money to keep things running. For Tom's Big Spiders, it was never, A, it was started off just kind of as a joke, then it turned into something big, and I was proud of just the fact that people felt like they could come to me for information when they needed it, so there was that, and it was never meant to be something to make money. I'm not trying to get freebies. I'm not trying to you know, monetize anything. It's just not what it's about for me, so people, I've actually had people get very frustrated with me. I had one guy that actually I believe stopped watching my channel and commenting because I wouldn't put up, I wouldn't monetize and I wouldn't put up a Patreon page, which I guess I understand the frustration. But to me, it's just weird asking people. I know you guys all have bills to pay. You're in a hobby that, quite frankly, costs a lot of money. And I don't expect people to have to give over their hard earned money for something I'm doing for fun and for free anyway. But people did. And then my buddy, Louis Roquet, who I talk to all the time, I believe is the one that set it up. We got in a discussion about it. He made me feel more comfortable about the whole thing. Still feel a little strange about it. And the irony of it, again, is the night before my computer broke, I was working on my Patreon page. I basically came down to the fact that the 
a lot of people, A, want to give something back and they get frustrated with me when I don't oblige and, and create the Patreon page. And then a lot of the bills are coming up for like my website bill will be up and my I, my podcast gets billed every week or every month. And sometimes when I go over on podcasts, I'm allotted three hours a month. And that sometimes comes into play where I have to decide, do I want to do an extra long episode? which will need paying extra money for the time I go over, which sometimes I do, and that's fine, and then sometimes I don't. So do I want to go that route, or do I end up cutting something short because I don't want to blow the extra money? And again, I'm not cheap, but it's just it does start to add up. So anyway, my thought was if I did a Patreon page, what I would do is take that money and just put it toward the production costs as far as just the paying for the actual website, which does come due every year, and then the cost of the podcast, which would allow me you know, to be a little more freedom as far as doing longer episodes. And again, some of them just, when I do the episodes, I don't really sit there and go, all right, I'm going to stop in the middle of something because I'm running out of time. But I do plan around, like I might have something I think is going to take an hour and I put it off to another billing period so that I don't take up all my time there. So anyway, the plan was I was going to set up the Patreon page, put it out there. I was trying to come up with what, you know, levels I was going to have. I was trying to come up with things to do. And then my computer broke and then this and, and so a huge, humble, heartfelt thank you, and I already posted something on Facebook for it, but I'm going to cover it in both the video and the podcast, videos and the podcast to, to get all the folks that were, you know, generous enough to give money, but a huge thank you to anybody who gave to this. Again, I was a little bit embarrassed at first, but uh, talk to some people, I'm feeling better about it. It's just, it's, it's always going to be weird for me taking any type of money or gift or anything for something that I'm honestly doing for fun. It's It's just hard to articulate. I know I've tried to before, but so I do want to thank Louis Roque, who, you know, I believe set this up. Hazel Ra, T Cake, Alicia Baker, Mark Tarantulas or Mark Simcox. Mark, thanks so much, buddy. Chris Elliott, Arwin Shackelford, Crystal Anderson, David Rios, Sean Smith, Mo Cologne, Veronica Shelton, Nancy Winchell, Tanya Stewart, hey Tanya, Ashley McPhee, Rick Peterson, John Waite, Andrew Perez, Shannon Gormley, and Beth McDaniel, I hope I pronounce everybody's name right. I have this huge thing for this. I think part of it comes from teaching. And I, I remember as a kid, teachers mispronouncing my name. I actually had one that called me Mr. Moron, which I, in retrospect, being a teacher is really irritating. But I, again, I hope I got everybody's name right. If not, correct me in the, in the comment section or whatever. Or let me know on Facebook because I don't want to get it wrong. But I tried to copy all these guys over onto when I did the Facebook post. I tried to copy everybody's name on there and, and link to them so they'd know. But some of these people, I, I don't know if they're on my friends list, unfortunately. And I, I was getting like some of them I put the name in. I get like 30 people popping up. So anyway, thank you so much. You, you shouldn't have. You really shouldn't have. And uh, I'm kind of glad I didn't get any wind to catch wind of this beforehand because I probably would have tried to stop it but I am again I don't want this to sound unappreciative I'm incredibly appreciative and it's making more sense to me now and I talked to some people at work and I was explaining what happened and like man that's amazing that's like incredible that they they came you know through for you like that and so again it's definitely nothing but appreciation and the first thing I ended up purchasing we did take the money from the Amazon account we had to get some stuff on Amazon so we put that toward what we use to fix the computer which luckily wasn't a big, well, it was a graphic, I guess my video card was down, it was a couple other things they did, and so it's up and running now, it's working great, and not making weird aircraft noises, but the other thing we did was purchase a microphone, so I did a bunch of research for the past week, trying to figure out which new microphone I should get, it came down to the Yeti, which I guess is the most popular one for like podcasts and this type of stuff, and the Samson one, I forget which model it was, well, the Samson one sounded like it was a little bit cheaper, and got just as good reviews as far as podcast so I originally picked that one up got it in uh, this week last weekend plugged it in and the thing did not work at all there was a but you could barely hear my voice there was a whining sound in the background it just wasn't very good at all so that one went right back into the box packed it up sent it back to Amazon and we went for the Yeti and so far I, I it's a huge hefty microphone it's got a lot more features than the other one had but it's also super sensitive. So a moment ago, I just had to stop because in my kitchen, which is probably about 40 feet away, one of the dogs was licking her paw and you could hear it clear as day. So I'm adjusting the gains, trying to make sure that it captures my voice well enough while not capturing the things behind me. So a little bit of stress this morning, trying to figure this one out. So anyway, I again, I 
again, just want to thank everybody that put money toward it. I'm floored, and it really drives home how tight knit this community is. I I definitely wasn't expecting it, still kind of uh, taken back by it, but uh, just absolutely floored and humbled by the generosity. So what we'll do going ahead is it is an Amazon gift card. Some of it's already gone toward the computer. We just spent a chunk of it on the mic and a mic stand. So I have the the arm now. Originally, I had the mic setting on my computer, sitting on my computer desk, and that wasn't necessarily the most convenient thing in the world. Now I have an arm. I bought one of the cheaper little arms to go in, so the mic's hanging off the arm in front of me. It almost looks like I know what I'm doing here, except for the fact that I got a funny feeling that I've got a lot of work to do in post-production because it's going to take me a while to get the thing set correctly. But as we move ahead, one of the things I was looking to do, and if I did the Patreon page and got more money than I needed to pay for the the actual website and the podcast is one of the things I'm doing moving ahead is doing a lot of these bioactive enclosures, which can be pricey, but I want to try out a lot of different enclosure types. I want to try out a different companies that produce, you know, the substrate and the plants and whatnot. So everything I get will be put toward that. The good thing is, I mean, one of the things with having a channel and having the podcast is that you're always looking for new things to do. I love reviewing things. I love not, I won't say exposing, but you know, warning people if something may not be worth the money. Conversely, I absolutely love telling people when I find something that's good. It's like when you find a good deal somewhere, I love sharing that. So moving ahead, what we will do is a lot more you know, reviews and things of that nature, which is something I plan on doing anyway with this bioactive stuff. I'm looking at some different enclosure types and whatnot. So it'll be all good. The money will be spent on stuff that will go just do Tom's Big Spiders and hopefully helping to continue to educate people on not only their spiders but how to best spend their money so again can't say it enough thanks so much for everybody don't ever do that no i'm just kidding i really do appreciate it It was just something that as it was unfolding it was bizarre for me to sit there and look at this chunk of money and go wow what 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 an amazing hobby i'm part of i mean i just again still trying to wrap my mind around it how truly generous people can be and it, it truly means a lot and it's been something that really kind of drove home the fact that uh, for me, this is just fun. This is just teaching. This is, I, 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 it's still just see myself as some dorky 40 something year old, you know, talking about spiders on, I, I never get over the fact that in my perception, this is just part of a dorky hobby. One of my dorky hobbies I do. So to know that people are that affected by it and that appreciative of it really adds that other level to me and kind of opens my eyes to the fact that it's not just a dorky hobby. It means a lot to a lot of people. So again, thank you all. I truly appreciate it. And uh, I, we'll be working on that Patreon page. So we never have to do anything like this again, because that, that was the other thing that came out of this is I never, it never occurred to me that like, if my computer blew, what would I do to replace it? For me, it's just my personal computer. But a lot of what I do now with Tom's Big Spiders, obviously all my editing, everything happens on that computer. So it's become part of Tom's Big Spiders machine, for lack of a better term. So it would be good, I guess, to open that up for people that want to give. I still don't feel comfortable about it. And we'll see how long it takes me to actually release it because it is done. I'm still just, I don't feel comfortable with it. That's what it comes down to. But as Billy pointed out, it's funny because we were going through the whole, all right, let's see if, if the computer can't get fixed. When will we be able to get a new one? I didn't want to just drop, you know, a couple hundred bucks and get a cheap one. I, I really needed a computer that could do the video editing I do. And she's like, well, you know what? If you, this might be one of those things that makes you rethink that Patreon page. And I'm like, you're right. This is This would be a good spot to have that money to make sure that at least things go undisrupted. So... I keep saying it. Thanks, everybody. I truly appreciate it. I can't even, I, I'm not good at expressing things this way, but I, I really was, for lack of a better term, touched by the generosity. It was amazing. So moving on with this one, and I'm terrible, again, we're just going to keep, <laughs> I'm going to keep this one rolling, and there may be a warning in the heading of this one that it sounds like garbage, because I'm, I'm trying to play with the gain as I go. I've stopped this a couple times because I'm clipping. I have this horrible problem that I'm working on, and I'm sure people have noticed it, that when I say my S's, I'm, I'm trying not to do it there, they whistle. I've noticed it when I teach. I notice it when I talk. Of course, when you're teaching, you're up in front, and you're moving your anime, and it's not as big of a deal. But when you're in front of a microphone, the microphone is unforgiving if you whistle your S's. Luckily, I don't think I pop my P's. So anyway, one of those things you never even think about because I had no intention of ever being a podcaster, but here we are. So I'm hoping this sounds good. I'm going to apologize profusely throughout this because I have a funny feeling that this one's not going to sound particularly great. I have, I do assure everybody I have been experimenting with this now since I got the mic for several hours and 
it's it's a work in progress. But moving on, one of the things I, I'm, I'm gonna one of the things I'm gonna continue doing going ahead is updating people on the bioactive enclosures because it's something I'm having a lot of fun with. So as long as everybody still wants to hear about it and there seems to be a lot of interest, I'm going to keep people updated on what I'm doing. And again, a lot of these will be, you'll be able to see the actual bioactive enclosures getting set up and the animals being rehoused on my YouTube channel. So if you're more of a visual person, that's the place to go. If not, I will try to describe everything as best I can here. But the newest update is I'm venturing into doing one for one of my piece of species. I've been, it was something that was in the back of my mind all along that I wanted to try this with pokies. Now I will tell you, this is going to sound funny, but the big thing that was holding me back and I'm still wondering how this is going to work, which is why I'm going to do probably one or two, see how it goes before I transfer everybody, is the fact that my pokies are poop machines. Their enclosures are just battered in feces it's they they basically just sit on something and they blow it all over the side of the enclosure and as much as i try to keep them clean they're constantly pooping all over everything including the fake plants so i started thinking when i was looking at species that i could do these with pokies were number one the ones i was thinking about at first and one of the things I started thinking about is, what is this going to look like? It's going to look great right at first. It's going to be beautiful. People are going to go, oh, look at the pretty vines and the plants and everything else. And then it's just going to be white and off-white everywhere as they poop all over everything. So trying to figure out how that's going to work. I mean, I can't really go in and wash the plants. Uh, the glass is obviously something that can be cleaned. I mean, we can, we can deal with the glass part of it. But the plants, I'm really worried about getting really nice plants in there and having them crap all over, for lack of a better term. So that's something that caused me pause. But I, I got it. I have to try this out. I just, I really have to. I have two P. rufaladas that are just gorgeous. And I really want to get them into something larger and something more ornate. And with some, you know, in the bioactive enclosure would be perfect. So that's the one I'm targeting. I also have a piece of Letheria regalis that I would like, very much like to set up in one of these. So what I did is I just purchased one of the, I believe it's the Zoomed ones, not the Exoterra, the Zoomed, because I like the fact that it had a higher litter dam in the bottom, for lack of a better term. And the 12 by 12 by 18, we're going to do one of those because one of the questions I get a lot is, are the Exoterra nanotals a good size for a pokey, for a piece of Letheria species? And personally, I've found that for most of the species, the ones that get to be, you know, the pokies that get to be seven inches or larger, they're too cramped for my taste. Does that mean it's wrong to keep a, a pokey in one of those? I'm not. Nope. This is a matter of opinion and people have success with different things. I'm saying personally speaking, I don't like that there's not enough room for me to work. It feels too cramped. I've always made it very clear that with pokies, I feel like I have success because I do give them enough room to kind of hide and not feel like they're threatened. So for me, those, I, I would try a Metallica in it probably, one of the smaller piece of Letheria species, but I don't think I'd try one of the bigger ones. So I'm, I'm going to do this as part of the video I'm going to do for this next enclosure I'm setting up, talk about the difference between the two, why I chose the 12 by 12 by 18. Honestly, I think if you want to go, if you think the 12 by 12 by 18 is a little large and it's a pretty good size enclosure and it's going to give your spider lots of room, then the 12 by 12 by 12 actually works pretty well. I mean, that's that's very comparable in size to the Sterilite containers I use to house my pokies in. Now, I found that many of them will come out and kind of sit on the cork bark but when they get startled they kind of have hides underneath the cork bark like they would in the wild they'd hide in crooks of trees and whatnot so i i do think the 12 by 12 by 12 although it doesn't have what you'd normally picture as an arboreal species dimensions like for example it's not taller than it is wide put a couple inches of substrate in there you still have a decent amount of height i mean they're 12 inches tall some good room you can lean a cork bark against the side you could do a cork bark tube it offers plenty of room but Anyway, for this one, I have chosen, I've been dying to work with one of these 12 by 12 by 18s, and I've gone a step further. I went to any herp and bought one of their background packages. Basically, it includes a big piece of cork bark that goes in the background, the screws, the pieces of cork bark tubes that are cut at angles so that you can actually affix them to the background and plant things in them or make a hide that kind of stands out. Picked up a bunch more plants picked up some drainage layer stuff materials that's one of the things people have brought up quite a bit is that i'm using bio dude stuff and i'm loving the bio dude stuff don't i don't want anybody to think this is me going away from bio dude i'm still i just bought more stuff from the bio dude it's just he's got some stuff that's really good i like the substrate but any herp is also nearby so when i buy my plants i don't have to worry about them freezing or anything or the weather so i'm, I'm trying out a bunch of places but the bio dude is the one that got me hooked on this stuff so i'm still buying the substrate the 
the stuff that you activate, the, the stuff you pour into the substrate with the bacteria and everything. I, I'm buying a lot of stuff from him as well. And one of the things he says is you don't need the drainage layers. And I think with some of the plants, it's true. It seems to work quite well. Obviously, one of the things he wanted to do with his substrate is make it so you could use it for fossorial tarantulas because that's one of the big issues when you set up a bioactive. If you have a drainage layer, it's really kind of difficult to set that up for a fossorial species. I mean, you put the drainage layer on, you put your piece of screen over the top of it, you put your substrate on it, well, the spider could easily dig right through that. So his substrate is designed to drain so that the water, and I have noticed this works very, very well. When you pour the water in, it at first it won't seem to sink in as well as you'd like. Like I've gotten used to over the years mixing things with vermiculite to allow the water to percolate through. Now the problem with that is the faster the water, I've found the faster the water percolates down through to the lower la layers, usually the faster it evaporates out. So for example, if I took cocoa fiber, mix it with vermiculite, and I pour water into it, that stuff soaks right down through. However, a week later it's bone dry. So his substrate, I've noticed, I will pour water in, and when I add water to my bioactive enclosures, again, we make it rain. I, I got to come up with a new thing for that because it just sounds so bad, but we, we pour the water in, make it like simulate like a, a rain shower. So it puddles up in the top, but by the next day, you can see that it soaks right down through to the bottom, and you can watch that line, especially if you're using the exoterra containers. You can watch the line where the substrate starts to dry out in the top, but it's still moist in the bottom, which makes it very easy to know when to re-add water. So the drainage on it, although it seems like it doesn't drain well at first, seems to work great. And I do want to do some isolated tests of this where I take a cup of, a cup of the substrate, pour water in, and monitor how long it takes for the water to go down, how long it stays. But we've, I've been having so much fun setting up these closures, I haven't done it yet. So that all said and done, I have seen some situations, some of the plants I've used, where they really need to have that drainage layer on the bottom. The more I've realized that I have a couple plants that haven't made it, and it's probably because the roots aren't able to dry out a bit, and they kind of like when you pour the water down, the water goes right to the bottom, which is great, but for some they need, they don't need those roots in the water all the time or whatever. I'm still trying to figure out the plant stuff. But I, and then I've had a lot of people ask about drainage layers, so it's something I want to try out. So from any herb, I bought a, a bag or two bags of their drainage material, which I believe is crushed it, it's like glass but it's not polished glass it's all it's very porous and, and rough and very light so we're going to try that out do a drainage layer on this one we're going to do the background i've got four species of plants i'm going to be using in it very excited to set this one up now the only problem with the setting up the bioactive enclosures that i found is that it, you have to have patience with them you get the plants like one of the things i get the plants i have to take the plants wash them off I repot them in the BioDude substrate, and then I wait a couple weeks to make sure that they take root and they're doing okay. Then I transfer them over to the actual enclosures, at which point, again, I like to wait and make sure they're doing okay. Now, this is already back, not backfired on me, but kind of backfired on me once where I set up the enclosure. It was all good to go. I, I shot a before video where I set up the enclosure, and I was just waiting for this to sit for a month so I could put the animal in it. Well, in the month that I was waiting for it to sit, the plant ended up dying. So I, I've replanted something else in there. I am going to be shooting that video. We're going to be rehousing one of my P. reduncuses into it tonight. So I'll be able to finally close that one off. But that's something that I've noticed I have to worry about is that when you let them sit there for a little while, sometimes they do very well. In most cases, the enclosures I'm setting up are doing great and I'm so excited with it. Sometimes they don't. The Ophil uh, Pinus that I set up, the plant that was in the front, I think it was Durkay and I, I got to double check on that one, but that one ended up dying off. So now I want to replace that one with probably Pothos, which is my favorite plant because it's unkillable. Absolutely love it. It makes me feel like I have a green thumb. Billy was talking the other night. We were laughing because I got in, I think, seven more plants from any herp yesterday and I already have like a planter on the table when he's planter trays with all the different little pots in it and I think we're up to like 15 or 20 around 15 or 20 plants growing in it and she's like I can't believe you have a green thumb and I'm like well let's not say I have a green thumb yet we're not at that point yet I, I'm keeping some things alive yes but I'm making some mistakes along the way that I'm trying to remedy We'll see how it goes. So the next big project and, and what I'll be doing later on today, first, we're going to finally rehouse something into the enclosure I set up, I think, a month and a half ago so we can finish my first Any Herp unboxing review. I've meant to do one for years, finally did one, shot it, was all excited to get it out, but I had to wait to put the spider in the actual enclosure we set up. So we're going to get that one out of the way. We also have a 12 by 12 by 12 Exoterra that's been set up that has, I believe, Photonia in it. 
as well as Golden Pothos. It looks stunning. The Photonia is doing amazing. It's probably about six inches tall now. I think when I got it, it was like three. And unfortunately, I did lose one Photonia that I got from any herp. I think what happened was they went to ship and our weather changed last minute and it got really, really cold. So I got a funny feeling when I got it out, it didn't look particularly great. Got it out, replanted it. So not on them. It, it, this was on... Just, it just unfortunately poor timing with the the shipping and it, it, there was no way they would have known that the weather was going to turn cold. I think it was supposed to be like 45, 50 and it ended up dropping to like 20. So it, it ended up dying. But the other one I got looks amazing. It's in the back corner of the enclosure. So I have to figure out what's going to go in there. Originally, this one was going to be for my Nandru Chromatis, but I'm not... I'm thinking in terms of size-wise, right now, it would be a great fit for the Nando. I mean, it's my Nando is a bit smaller, probably about five inches total. I think it would be a good fit, but I'm thinking if the Nando puts on a lot of size, it's going to outgrow that enclosure pretty quickly, and then what am I going to do? Pull it out? I can't really put another animal in there, so it means dismantling the whole enclosure. So I'm thinking probably a, a P. Sosme Brazilian Blue or is going to go into that one. It's a little higher than I would like, but my P. Sosmes are about five inches or so, and I think they look beautiful in it. So we have to shoot that one as well. And then it's we're going to do a tutorial, which is going to be a pretty crappy tutorial, honestly, because I don't know what I'm doing particularly well. But we're going to do a tutorial on how to set up one of the backgrounds for one of these things. And they do have excellent directions on any herp on how to do it. I, I did used to work, I used to do uh, fiberglass boat repair, painting, varnish, carpentry, things of that nature. So I, I'm not completely unskilled in that area. So I'm sure I could probably figure this out and their directions were quite good. So I have you know some ideas of how to go about it, but we're gonna set up that background, set up this enclosure, put some plants in and then unfortunately it'll probably be a month or so before we actually put the animal into it and get to do that video so a lot going on with the bioactive stuff and again for folks who are just getting into the hobby that are listening to this you're driving to work you're like oh gosh I, I can't do any of this stuff right now I'm not abandoning the beginner material that is my bread and butter I will never get away from it it's just it's one of those things where I think a lot of people that started watching my channel, reading my website, and watching and listening to the podcast years ago, we you outgrow some of the material in some respects. I think the one thing I've got going for me is the fact that I do keep a lot of weird species, so I think people keep coming back, even if they've been in the hobby for a while, just to kind of find out how I'm keeping a certain species, which is great. But I've always wanted to do something for folks that have been in the hobby for a little while that have their basic husband view down, that some of these topics are like, yeah, yeah, I know that. And I know people have been great, and what I love hearing is, I had somebody contact me the other day. He's like, Tom, I've been you know, watching your videos now for four years. I've got a collection of like 75 species, and I still love going back and listening to just some little tips and tricks that you do. And that means the world to me because I, a, a while back, I had somebody that was a, a listener that I saw on a post somewhere that they were like, yeah, I used to like Tom Moran, but he's kind of boring now because all he does is beginner stuff. And I thought wait a minute, I do. I, I, I don't consider myself a beginner anymore. I report on everything I do. I do some things that aren't just beginner uh, focused, but that is something I want to make sure that people of all skill levels find a little something in my material. I don't want this to just be, you know, all right, my first few months in a hobby, I listened to Tom, but now I've outgrown this. I'd like, to, I'd like people to grow with me because I'm still growing. Obviously, this is, talk about beginner, I'm a beginner with the bioactives right now. This is all a whole different level for tarantula keeping. For me, it's a whole new learning curve. I'm loving it. I'm the type of person that when I realize there's nothing left to learn on a topic or I feel like that I've kind of got a good handle on it, it starts to get a little boring. And I wasn't at that point at all with tarantulas. Let me make that very, very clear. This just added a lot more complexity, made it a lot more fun because now I'm still working, you know, I'm doing husbandry. I'm aligning the husbandry with the husbandry of the plants I'm keeping. I love greenery. I love it. I was choking a billy. We came down last night and I, again, have that tray on my table, which God bless my wife for letting me, you know, our dinner table literally has just a bunch of plants on it right now. And I came down and I pointed to the middle of the tray and I go, I would like to be a little person and live right there with all this lush greenery around me. And she laughed at me and told me I was a dork and she was right. But I, I love this. It's like combining two things that I absolutely love. So moving ahead, there will be beginner stuff. I will go back. One of the things I'm going to continue doing is try to do a, some husbandry notes every single podcast. But as opposed to have having all the podcasts just focus on one specimen or another, again, I told you I'm going to be doing some with just alphabetically. Like I'll just go, we're going to go C today. And we're going to go through a couple of the obscure C species I keep, or C, uh, C uh, gen genera. What I also like to do is mix things up so everybody gets a little something out of it. So people that are beginners, 
They get to hear how to keep something. They get to hear some beginner tips. People that are more advanced get to hear some of the stuff I'm doing with the bioactives and the enclosure styles and things of that nature. And then everybody gets to hear a little something. The, the people that have been in a while maybe pick up something from my beginner tips. Like, hey, I never thought of that. The people that are beginners go, man, I can't wait to someday where I feel comfortable enough to do the bioactives and they know where to come for the information. So the idea, it's it's like the Harry Potter books. Uh, anybody that read the Harry Potter books, they kind of grew with the audience. They started off a bit more childish. But then as their readers grew, grew they became more adult in themes and content and the writing style tightened up we're, we're going to be the harry potter of tarantula information harry the uh jk rawlings of uh, tarantula information that's probably the worst analogy i've ever broken out and there's a big part of me that's going to want to edit this out of here because i feel like a total goober right now but best example i can come up with is i'm going to try to grow with the audience while keeping those people that are new to the hobby because i I have people that email and go, you're probably sick of hearing this, but I just got into the hobby and I found your stuff and I love it. No, I will never get sick of hearing that. That's what makes this worthwhile. That's why I don't feel like I need to be compensated monetarily for what I do because that's the satisfaction knowing that remembering what it was like to get into the hobby and a struggle and be afraid to ask questions and be afraid to get torn apart when you post on a board or on a Facebook group about something went wrong to feel like I could go to somebody and say, hey, this happened, I'm really worried, and have somebody not judge me and go, no, hey, no problem, been there, done that, that means the world to me to know that I'm providing that for somebody. And then to have some of the people that have been around for a while go, hey, man, you're really picking it up. I, I thought I was going to be drifting away, but I actually got an email like this the other day. It made my day. Is like, still listen to your stuff, but you know, I wasn't as you know jumping on it, but you've been doing this bioactive stuff, and I'm really interested and start asking questions about bioactive. There's somebody has been doing it for five years. So again, trying to cover all the bases here, make sure that I I'm not just catering to one group or another, continuing with the beginner stuff, people who want to follow me where I start experimenting with more advanced techniques and, and things of that nature. I'm, I'm here for that and just try to get as many people as possible and then hopefully get to keep that attitude going that, you know, there's a way to when people have questions to deal with it, tearing them apart on a public forum. You know, I do think there are spots where people need to realize, hey, you kind of made a big boo-boo here, but you don't need to, uh, I'm trying to think of a polite term, you don't need to poo all over them and, and make them feel terrible about it. That wasn't particularly polite, but it's the best I could come up with. I haven't finished my coffee yet. I can't drink my coffee because if I touch my coffee cup, just me touching the, spyro the styrofoam cup gets picked up by this microphone. Like, I'm afraid there's going to be all kinds of stuff on this. But being more polite to each other, stopping some of the fighting. Again, I mentioned recently, I, I'm, all, I'm not off of Facebook, but I don't check it very often now because I'm tired of the garbage on it. Let's make things a little nicer for everybody. So that's where we're going again. This is kind of, I, I, this is obviously a weird podcast because I'm going all over the place, but I, I do feel like sometimes these are necessary just for people to understand where I'm coming from, what's going on with me. Obviously, I had to thank people for what they're doing. Uh, for giving the money towards fixing the computer and whatnot. So I guess this warrants an, uh, a more different approach this time around. So now that I'm recording with this one, this microphone has an earphone jack, and I actually get to hear my voice real time as I'm doing it, which is disturbing in a way. But I am also hearing the fact that now you can definitely hear my dogs snoring and licking in the background. So I'm going to apologize in advance and hope in most cases... It, if anybody wonders why I speak so fast or so quickly with these podcasts, part of it is I know at any given moment, somebody's going to make a noise behind me. I have four dogs sleeping in here right now. So I'm hoping, there goes one right there, dog snoring. I'm hoping that in the most part, my voice will drown those out. So moving on, one last thing I do want to cover, a species of tarantula that somebody asked about. I've actually been asked quite a bit about, which is the Nandru trapepi. One of my favorite spiders in my collection is my Nandru trapepi. I absolutely love that girl, that crazy, fluffy little demon. Um, I've gotten quite a bit of traffic on that video lately. I think YouTube every once in a while just picks up picks a video and they just recirculate it in. And this is an older one I did on mine. I do have to do an update on her home. She's going to molt soon. She hasn't eaten in quite a while. She's quite fat, quite dark in the abdomen. But a lot of people have been asking how they are as intermediate species. Now, I'm going to be full disclosure here because that's one of the things I've always tried to do. This is not a species I've raised from a sling. It is one I'm looking to get slings of because I want that experience. It happened to be, I think I got them from Tom Patterson a couple years back who had a sexed female. She was like four inches and I normally don't buy sex females but I saw a picture of the species I'm like I need to have this it was one of the few times I've done this and I'm glad I did because it, it sold me on that species but I do want the experience of raising one from a sling so when I'm speaking coming up with what I'm about to say a lot of it I haven't done personally and I always like to make that very clear I've not raised one from a sling however I can tell you how I will raise my slings if that helps so this isn't technically first-hand knowledge from this point because I got her she was a juvenile young adult now she's an adult but 
Anyway, the big question has been whether these can be an intermediate species. I think they can. I mean, I think the biggest issue I've had with mine is the fact that she's a little bit wacky. Um, quirky would be a good way of putting it. She's qu quick and she'll kind of dart around her enclosure. But this is the one I was telling people that I used to open the enclosure and she'd come right up to the edge and kind of curl her feet around it and wait. And I didn't know if she was waiting for food to be fed, but it was a, a unique behavior that I haven't seen for many species. I mean, my homeoma, hom yeah, homeoma chilensis, I still get confused with the Uathlis and homeoma, I, I want to say Uathlis species, and sometimes I say homeoma species. Homeoma chilensis is one that when I open them up, both of them will go climbing out over the edge to explore. She kind of does this, but then will like quickly scuttle away and retreat. So really unique behavior from her. She has never kicked a hair at me, which is good because she's got a big old booty full of hair and the hair of Nandu species are supposedly pretty bad, although I believe the chromatis is supposed to be the worst of the, the I believe, five species. I could be wrong here. Um, and the tripepi supposedly isn't as bad, but remember, hairs affect people differently. I, I get really badly affected by Lasiodora species, especially my parent, my LP. When she kicks, it's pretty nasty. Other people, it doesn't bother as much. So it's, it depends on your, your own body chemistry. But mine has never really been a hair kicker anyway, so it hasn't been a big deal. And I, I don't even, the, the term skittish, when I picture skittish, is once they're bolting all around scared, she's just kind of she'll run up to the edge she'll look at you for a minute she'll run back to her her cave but next thing you know she's right back out again like she's ready to eat weird behavior i just that's why i love her so much and i don't know maybe this is just mine this could be just my specimen not everybody else's everybody's you know the behavior obviously varies from specimen to specimen but that's how mine's behaved ever since i've gotten her she's molted i think three times so a fast grower get quite large i think mine's pushing seven inches now fantastic eater they eat great and know that you know these are one of the ones you drop a roach in she'll fly across the enclosure grab the roach but uh, as far as moisture dependency that's where it gets a little trickier now i have found when her enclosure dried up once and dried up a bit it wasn't completely bone dry but i noticed she was hovering around the water dish and that's always a sign that they want more humidity so i do keep part of the substrate moist at all time i do give her a full water dish at all time but besides that if you give her an if i i reckon if you gave one enough room you gave him a little extra room and i'm not saying drop one in a 20 gallon long tank but if you give them enough you know a five gallon tank would probably be good with some decent floor space even a 10 gallon tank for an adult you're going to have less worries about her actually bolting out. Mine are kept in a sterile container. It's got the floor space just a little bit larger than a five-gallon tank. I will be putting her into probably a much larger one, possibly a bioactive. We'll see how it goes. But that might make you feel a little more secure. But that's about it. That's what you need to worry about. There's a little moisture dependency, I think. And I'm sure there's folks out there probably keep theirs dry. I've just found that if I ever find one hanging around a water dish, that's a spider that probably would appreciate some moist substrate. And the fact that she will bounce around that enclosure. Again, she's never run out of the enclosure. There are times where it looks like she's going to run out of the enclosure, but she doesn't. So that needs to be considered. As far as slings are concerned, I talked to a buddy of mine, I raised him up, said they were hardy as heck, and his eat quite voraciously as well. They will do some burrowing. I would keep a sling and probably, you know, a smaller sling and a 16 ounce deli cup with some room to burrow, moist substrate. Uh, juvenile, you're looking at a gallon size around there. And again, it's a very hardy species. So as long as you don't let them dry out, they do, should do quite well. You're going to have, you know, it's one I'm dying to watch grow up from a little sling. I've seen the slings. I've obviously have my adult that's gorgeous. Definitely, I would recommend this to people as an, an intermediate species that have kept, you know, they have their basic husbandry down. These guys would be a fun one, a fun stepping stone. Because again, although they do appreciate some moisture, they seem to do okay if it's dry. And I, ha I have spoken to people that say they just put a big water dish in and let it, you know, the substrate stay dry. So those are species that have, you know, they can adapt. They have some adaptability, but I would, I think it would be prudent to give them at least some moist substrate. But as far as care is concerned, they're hardy. You're going to have a sling that's going to grow up rather quickly into a hopefully beautiful, blonde, rambunctious female. And male's obviously beautiful too, but everybody wants a female because of the longevity. But just an awesome spider. And honestly, one of my personal, you know, a lot of times we do lists, species lists, like favorite species, which I have a terrible time with because if I'm keeping something, I like it. I have a hard time picking favorites. But if we went to like favorite specimens, like actual spiders, individual spiders in my collection, she would be up there probably top three. I just, she cracks me up. She's pretty, I mean, she really is pretty. She pictures like a, I have a yellow lab model. She's a black 
crab golden retriever cross Molly, and she reminds me of Molly. Like Molly's kind of kooky, running around. She does the same thing. So, yes, I do think they could be good intermediate species. Maybe, I guess for somebody that has you know a beginner that's kind of moving through quickly, that would be a good stepping stone to some of the more difficult ones. But I do think it would be prudent to keep them moist as slings. I keep mine moist as an adult. I'm sure people will chime in to keep them different ways. This is one I would love to get in a bioactive because she's very, very visible. And she would just look stunning sitting among some, you know, gorgeous, you know, carefully chosen foliage. So that is one I will probably do that with. I, lo I love the Nandu species overall, so I, they're probably all going to get one. But anyway, great species. I'd love to see more of them out there. I know some folks are selling slings now, so if you see one out there, I'd definitely pick one up. And even if you're, you know, you've been doing this for a few months and you're in the hobby, you kind of get in the hang of it and stuff. One of the things that we don't talk about a lot is sometimes when you get slings, by the time they're grown up and you have to deal with a, you know, larger, crazier, possibly more intimidating specimen, you've already got that experience. I have speech like when I got my OBT, I was, uh, was worried about not being ready for her. By the time she got to the point where she was large enough that, that, to worry me, I had already kept so many species and had pokies and everything else. It wasn't a big deal. So that's something to think about too. They're going to go quickly, quickly. You probably, I'm guessing would go uh, under right circumstances. If it's, you know, higher seventies or mid to higher seventies, if she's eating an aggressive schedule, you probably grow, have a three inch spider within a year or so. They do grow rather quickly, but that's still gives you time to adjust and by the time that three inches comes around it's time to rehouse you're probably ready for that so yes awesome species i highly recommend nandru trepepi to anyone who is into big fluffy cool kooky spiders i've talked to other people that say theirs behavior mimics mine so i think it goes just beyond mine being a little kooky other people seem to have the kooky spiders too that's our word of the day so definitely give those guys a try all right, so that will about do it for this one. I got a funny feeling I'm going to spend a lot of time on my editing program later on trying to make this sound good. If you're listening going, dear Lord, this new microphone isn't working for me, I'm going to continue to work with it. I'm going to figure out how to make this sound better. I will tell you just a moment ago, a truck drove by probably not, not even my street, one of the passing streets, and I can literally hear it in the microphone. So I'm, again, I'm going to turn the gain down even further next time. We'll do some more experimentation with it. But it got to the point where Billy was going out shopping, and this was my window to get the podcast done today. And here we are. So if you're listening to this in your speakers and it's not coming out stereo, I apologize. Right now when I play it back, it only comes back on one earphone. I'm praying that that will change when I go to edit this out. Uh, furthermore, if you hear noises in the background, you know, all those times I was referring to my dog snoring or farting or licking themselves, you're probably going to hear them all now. So again, I promise you I will continue to work with this and try to improve it. Try to, you know, right now I've been playing with the, the gain and the distance from my face. It'll get better. So Again, want to get back to thanking everybody who gave money toward that GoFundMe campaign. Uh, again, I can't thank you guys enough. And I know there are folks like, if I knew about it, I would have given more. I'm kind of glad people didn't know about it because it was already humbling enough. It, we don't want it to be too humbling. Uh, the Patreon page is, is up and running, and I will start probably talking about it legitimately soon. I'm, I'm just... Still not okay with it. Still feels weird. So stay tuned for more information on that. And obviously, if you've found me, you're only listening to my podcast. I do have Thomas Big Spiders on YouTube where you can see a lot of this stuff if you have the time. I know folks that listen to podcasts, it's on the way to work. It's while mowing the lawn. It's while doing things so they don't have to concentrate on video. Completely understand that. But if you hear something on here that I'm talking about and you're like, man, I'd love to see what that looks like, you could probably pop over on a weekend and check out a video. I have the website, which I've been, uh, I really need to get back to. I this every single time but they're just summer's coming i'll have more time to get back to things but uh that's got a lot of older information articles and things of that nature that people seem to find useful so i'll do it for this one thanks so much again thank you to all the gave to that gofundme page i'm still feeling like floored by it I, I can't even articulate how much i appreciate all of your generosity and the people that even thought about giving trust me i get it billy and i were dirt poor for many many years and there was a situation where we wanted to give and just please don't ever feel bad about that. The fact that people just stop by and say thanks for doing it is enough for me. So that'll do it for this one. Uh, kind of a weird podcast and I uh, hope to catch you guys next time. You don't all abandon me after this weird long run on podcast.